Welcome to worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. My name is Reverend Jennifer Innes. It is my great joy to be the minister with this congregation of people of all ages at all stages of life. This is a beloved community striving to live into its mission of embracing freedom, loving wholeheartedly, growing in mind, body, and spirit, and adding to the wholeness and the healing of the world. We are unapologetically progressive. In welcoming people of all ethnicities and races, sexual orientation, gender identities, social and economic situations and abilities, we advocate for human rights and we want to be and we try to be good stewards of this earth. It is good to be together. Let me take a moment and welcome all who are among us we recognize how deeply we are connected. And part of how we recognize that connection is that we know we are on the ancestral home of the Peoria people. This is where these people and many other nations gathered and lived into their lives and their communities before the first Europeans came. We honor the Peoria people every time we gather in service. We honor them for who they were and for the, who they are today. I also want to welcome our visitors and guests who are among us. Thank you for being with us today. It is no small thing to reach out in our human endeavor to know and be known. So please help us get to know you by wearing a name tag. Look at that. It is a technical fix. It's great. Our ushers and our greeters, any member, in fact, who has a plastic name tag will be happy to answer questions as well. And you're welcome to stay after the service, get to know us a little bit better, help us get to know you. We have a gathering and fellowship in our fellowship hall as well. And if you're joining us online, welcome. And I want to invite you all to greet each other in the courts of things and also stay online for the online chat after the service. Now, Recognizing this online thing that we have going on these days, I know that many of us have devices of various kinds with us. And I'm not asking you to put them away, but I will ask, would you put them in worship mode, which is either vibrate or silent, your choice. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce our guest minister for this morning, the Reverend Michael Brown, who is with us today. Michael served with this congregation as its minister for 27 years. Wow! And was named Minister Emeritus by the congregation upon his retirement in 2018. He and his spouse, Diane, now call Santa Fe their home. It is such a pleasure to welcome Michael back to lead worship in Peoria. This is the first time he's been able to come and back and lead worship since the pandemic. So, yes, we're doing it again. We are... Coming back to more firsts. All right. And in honor of Michael and Diane's presence with us today, we have a potluck. Thank you to everybody who's been bringing food in to share. Please stay and help us nourish each other. Now, let me offer a note. Uh, next Sunday is our blessing of the animals. All ages are welcome to bring beloved creature friends in person or to have a, to bring a photo. If in person, I do ask that your beloved creature friend be on a leash or appropriately contained for the moment. We will be diverse in many ways. So thank you. In two weeks, uh, on September 3rd, will be the question box sermon. That is a moment when... You all share with me your questions, and I do my best to answer them in the course of the service. Uh, and this is a lovely moment for us to kind of create the service together. So please hold on to those questions, save them for two weeks from today, and we'll get to them in that moment. And they also help kind of set, give me some clues and information about what to talk about for this coming year. So by all means, bring all the questions. Now, uh, one of the ways that we help each other get to know each other is we take a time during our service for greeting our neighbor. 
this is that moment. And if you offer a hug or a handshake, please ask uh, for consent because we are a consent-based community. And now after our greeting the neighbor, I will bring us back in with our opening hymn. And now, greet your neighbor. Hi. <laughs> Test, test. Yeah, yeah, we should go. Rise and body your spirit.
Good morning. Good to see you this morning. <laughs> what a great, what a great thing. I'm so pleased to be here and uh, be back in this beautiful space. And boy, I know almost all of you. Really, it's, it's just extraordinary. It's like we've all been through something together. Wow, what a great thing. My name is Michael Brown. Uh, my pronouns are he and him. Diane and I have just arrived from the uh, ninth, I think, Parliament of the World's Religions in Chicago, along with a number of other people who are in this room at the moment. Um, I will say more about that in a little bit. But the opening words this morning come from the 1893 Parliament of the World's Religions, the very first one that happened on this planet, so far as we know. And at, it happened at um, the Art Institute building in Chicago. That's where it took place. And there was a young man from India named Swami Vivekananda who really made an impression on the parliament, he was, became kind of the most well-known person of that event. And he said some very strong things about how religion should change. And he made an effect. So the opening words come from uh, Swami Vivekananda's closing speech to the Parliament of the World's Religions in 1893. If the parliament of religions has shown anything to the world, it is this. It has proved to the world that holiness, purity, and charity are not the exclusive possessions of any church in the world, and that every system has produced men and women of the most exalted character. In the face of this evidence, if anybody dreams of the exclusive survival of their own religion and the destruction of others, I pity them from the bottom of my heart and point out to them that upon the banner of every religion will soon be written, in spite of resistance, help and not fight, assimilation and not destruction, harmony and peace, and not dissension. I'd like to invite Lila McRae up to light our chalice this morning. Lila was one of our parliament participants this week. Hello. Uh, we have a reading by uh, Bear W. Tulescua the hearth of the chalice. As we light the chalice, may our souls become its hearth. We join our hearts to the one great flame of bright compassion, beloved community, and fervent justice. May we become lanterns to the world, lighting the way for all. So part of the spirit of the Parliament experience of this week, we're sharing a little bit about that in this service. And one of the joys um, is in such an experience, uh, in a global experience such as that, uh, is, to, uh, is to experience acts of service and connection. My colleague, the Reverend Joanna Crawford from the Unitarian Universalist Congregation, Live Oak Congregation in Austin, Texas, created a video about the nourishment provided by the Sikh community in particular. And we'll hear that message now. 
It is the fourth day of the Parliament, and I am here at the Langar that is generously provided by the six every day. It's a lunch in here and definitely one of the most meaningful and appreciated traditions. It's one of the most profound experiences of religious hospitality that I've ever experienced. Every, Every lunch, lunch during, during the, the week, week of Parliament, of Parliament the six, six feed, feed all, all of the Parliament, Parliament participants, participants at no charge. No charge. This, this is, is a religious, religious ritual, ritual for them, in which, in which everyone, everyone who physically can sits, sits on the ground next, next to each other, regardless, regardless of class, class or rank, and they bring, and they bring around, around pail after pail of delicious vegetarian food. You're, you're encouraged, encouraged to eat as, as much as you'd like, but waste nothing that has been blessed. And they do have tables for those unable to sit on the ground. You walk, you walk in, in remove, remove your shoes, wash, wash your hands, hands, and cover your hair. All, all genders. They'll provide, They'll provide a kerchief, a kerchief if you don't already have a scarf. You're, You're greeted, greeted with, with warm, warm smiles, smiles, handed a divided plate and a spoon, and pointed to an open place to sit. Swiftly, six come around with giant pans of fresh naan, pails of curries, rice, vegetables, dessert, mango lassi, you eat, you chat with your neighbors, refills are there every minute, someone comes around to take your plate and trash. And then there's chai on your way out. If you ever get the chance to experience a langar, jump. So as one is drinking chai on the way out, uh, in the tent, the six had a display of their history the origin and the meaning of the Langar, and this year, an impressive coin collection dating back to the 1500s. Yes, you can get your geek on at Parliament. It's a lot of fun. I want to add something about the meaning of the Langar uh, that they had included in their written uh, information, because it's not only an act of service deeply embedded in the Sikh community, but it's also important to them, part of what they're trying to do is illuminate and give people the lived understanding of the value of sharing a meal with others. Being in the Langar tent was to enter their world for a moment and emerge a little different than before you went in. Now, as a congregation, we recognize and practice giving in our own ways. This congregation relies on the generous, generous financial gifts of members and friends to sustain our ministry. And we also share a portion of our donations with the local agency. Now this month, we are sharing our plate with Hope Renewed Youth Conference, Inc., or HRYC, they provide scholarships to deserving candidates in the professions of teaching and law enforcement. And the recipients commit to working in, a, in the community after college. Now, HRYC in Peoria is specifically focused on nurturing youth who will remain in Peoria in those vocations and add to the racial diversity of the professions themselves. So for our Share the Plate practice, uh, Two-thirds goes to the running of the congregation, and one-third goes to the named agency. I invite you to you can use the envelopes that are available in the pews as the plate comes by. Indicate uh, offering, uh, indicate its use. If you'd like it all to go to the share of the plate, go to the church. If it's your pledge or so on. Uh, and also, if you are technically minded, see the QR code in the order of service to make an online donation. Thank you so much for all of your gifts. Now, during our music for meditation, the ushers will pass the plate. And after the plates have passed, you're welcome to come forward and light a candle uh, before us for what is in your mind and on your heart. And now let the ushers come forward.
I invite you to settle into this moment, this present moment, and pause and breathe. Spirit of life, who draws us together in a web of holy relationships. Make your presence known with us and in us and among us. Remind us that we are not alone in history. Ignite with us the courage of the living tradition. Remind us that we are not alone in entering the future. Anchor us with patience and perseverance. Remind us that we are not alone in our times of grief and pain. Comfort us with your spirit, manifest in human hands and voices. Remind us that we are not alone in joy and wonder. Inspire us to honor and extend the beauty we find in this world. Divine music of the universe, let our hearts beat in diverse and harmonious rhythms, cooperating in the everlasting dance of love. May we move with the rhythms of peace. May we move with the rhythms of compassion. May we move with the rhythms of justice. Source of stars and planets and water and land. Open our hearts to all of our neighbors. Open our souls to a renewal of faith. Open our hands to join together in the work ahead. So may we be so open and so of service into this common life. Let us hold one more moment together of quiet for all of the joys, the sorrows, the names and the milestones that live within us. For there are many. For there are many. Let us pause and honor all that is unspoken and within us in this moment. Amen, shalom, and namaste. Now we have our Time for All Ages with Jesse Lockman. This past week, I was one of the many folks in our congregation who did travel up to Chicago for the Parliament of World Religions. I saw so many things. I experienced different kinds of worship. I heard from great thinkers. And I was challenged to think for myself. It was a very precious time that I am glad to be able to share back with you today. Cullen has a brief video to show us of some of the sites and the ideas that were shared at Parliament. In 1893, religious leaders from around the globe came together in Chicago for the first parliament of the world's religions. The meeting was a groundbreaking gathering of representatives of Eastern and Western spiritual traditions. Today, it is recognized as the birth of interfaith dialogue worldwide. 
100 years later, at the 1993 Parliament in Chicago, religious leaders came together again to affirm the Declaration towards a global ethic. The Declaration is a powerful statement of the ethical common ground shared by the world's religious and spiritual traditions. Now, 30 years later, representatives of the world's religious traditions will once again gather in Chicago to affirm human rights and the productive discourse that comes from interfaith dialogue. The 2023 Parliament convening in Chicago will address one of the foundational issues of our time, the threat to freedom and human rights. We must defend freedom and human rights together and find solutions to the rise of autocracy in our world. Through this lens, gathered participants will discuss the threat to democracy, the crisis of climate change, the dignity of women and girls, the rights of indigenous peoples, engaging the next generation, peace, justice, the reduction of inequalities, and more. The Parliament will be a place of open minds and open hearts, where we can all express the wonder and dignity of our religious and spiritual traditions against the backdrop of the majestic beauty of Lake Michigan. The world was called to Chicago in 1893 and 1993. 30 years later, the world is called again. Join us. I wonder what would happen if we all believed in the global ethic, in the rights of women, in caring for our earth, in protecting democracy. I wonder. I invite you to now sing out the children in the congregation while we head back to religious education. Once again, I'm so happy to be here. Just want to make sure you know that. Um, I'm going to talk about the parliament today, partly because I just left there yesterday. I've still got that parliament vibe going a little bit. But I will say to you that I don't know anything else in the world that I could talk to you about today that would be more important than this message. And so this is the best I have to offer right now. So I want to tell you a little bit about where the parliaments came from. Um, the first parliament was held in 1893 in the building. I bet, I bet lots of you have been in the Art Institute in Chicago. That's where the parliament took place in 1893. Interestingly enough, one of the people who created that 1893 parliament was a Unitarian minister. His name was Jenkin Lloyd Jones. And he was quite an active and well-known Unitarian in Chicago in the late 1800s. He had kind of a district office. He published a, a newsletter magazine that was very popular. And he went around starting churches in, in the Midwest. He, he was really a significant uh, leader in Unitarianism. And when Jenkins Lloyd-Jones realized that there was going to be a World's Fair in Chicago, 
1893, the Columbian World Exposition, he, along with a few other uh, clergy in Chicago, said, you know what? We ought to invite all the religious leaders of the world to come to the fair and we all sit down and talk about life. And so they did that. They, they organized what was called at that time a World Congress of Religion. And he was a central person in making this happen. I was in the office of the parliament about five or six years ago, and in their lobby on the wall, there was a portrait of him. So he is very significant in this history. So uh, what happened in 1893? Well, people came from all over the world. It was the first time that Asian religious leaders met Western religious leaders. That had, that had not happened before. And this one young man, Swami Vivekananda, who uh, I read from through the opening words, really created a stir in the parliament. As a matter of fact, he was not invited to the parliament, but he came. You didn't have to be invited, but he, and he didn't have any money either to get there. But somehow he decided that he was going to go, and he got there somehow, and the message that he delivered to the parliament, summarized in a few words, was the age of conversion is over, and the age of cooperation is beginning. So no more of this conversion stuff. I don't want to be converted by you, and I don't want you to convert me. So I, I, we're going to share. We're equals, and we're going to see what we can do to make the world a better place. And it was a powerful message, and it, it marked a change in interfaith relations around the world. After this parliament in Chicago, the leaders tried to organize another one for 20 years later. After That's a pretty long time to try to get your committee together. Um, but they couldn't make it happen. It fell through. They couldn't get any backing. And so that parliament 20 years later did not happen. And the next parliament was 100 years. That's a long time. So as the 100th anniversary approached, which would be in 1993, uh, a group of leaders again said, let's have a parliament uh, on the 100th anniversary of the 1893 meeting. And they did pull that off. There were some Unitarians involved in that as well. So when I heard about this, 1993 Parliament, when Diane and I heard about it, I, I just knew that I wanted to go there. I mean, how could I not want to go to a place where the religious leaders of all the world are going to get together and talk about what they think is going on in the universe? And non-religious people, too. One of the things that's important to know is non-religious people take place in the Parliament. It's not limited to people who have a religious affiliation. Atheists come. They try to convert everybody. I don't know if it's working or not. I really don't. That was such a tremendous week for me in 1993. Um, I was trying to write down some of the people I was in the room with and heard speak, including the Dalai Lama, Thich Nhat Hanh, Sri Chinmoy, Karen Armstrong, a tremendous writer on religious topics. Jane Goodall, who is a famous scientist and has been, I think, to every parliament except 1893. And that I also, by the way, have been to every parliament except 1893. Um, Jean Houston, Diana Eck, Hans Kuhn, who you may have never heard of, but he is the person who wrote the first draft of what became the Global Ethic and was signed by a number of significant religious leaders in 1993. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the global ethic in just a minute. But it is a significant document in my opinion and the opinion of many others. And um, it's worth knowing about and learning about. So at the end of that parliament, I was hooked. I mean, I was totally hooked. I knew that this is something 
I wanted to be part of the rhythm of my life because I got such a, I got inspired is really what happened. I got inspired. So in 1999, the next parliament was in Cape Town, South Africa. So even if you cared nothing about religion at all, you would want to go there. Uh, Carol Lowe attended that parliament. And another woman from Peoria who's not a member of this church, uh, Marcy Gitrich, who I bet some of you know. The three of us were the three Peoria attendees in 1999. On the last night of that parliament, there was a big uh, meeting in a, a, a large arena called the um, Good Hope Hall, I think it was called. And the, schedule, the, the scheduled uh, speaker, main speaker, was Nelson Mandela. And we were in a room, we were in a room, there was, I would say, about 3,000 people from the parliament, two or 3,000, I don't know, and another two or 3,000 from the city of Cape Town. I'm guessing at the numbers. But it was a big crowd in a big arena. And um, there, was a, there were chairs on, on the stage, and different speakers were getting up and giving their speeches. But Mandela was nowhere to be found. And we're all thinking, is Nelson Mandela coming? And um, at one point, a guy was giving a speech, and somebody entered from a side entrance, kind of like if they had entered from that door and come up this ramp and tried to be unobtrusive so as not to, to if you're Nelson Mandela, you cannot be unobtrusive. And as he came and sat down quietly in his seat on the stage, that hall just erupted. There was such an outpouring of love. I can hardly remember that without feeling the power of it. People yelled out his name and they got up and they went and they suddenly chanted and they started drumming. They just were in love with that. Thousands of he was a liberator. And so that's a moment that, that is precious to me. And what he said that night, it was during the AIDS, really heavy AIDS crisis days, 1999. What he said that night is to, to solve the biggest problems of the world, the world's religions need to get together and work in cooperation. He, told, he gave us that, you know, mission. So, a precious moment. A number of us went to Barcelona in 2004, where it was the first time I ever attended the, the Langer. They had Langer out on the, in tents on the beach in Barcelona, on the Mediterranean. A wonderful, wonderful experience of generosity. Can you imagine offering free lunch to 7,000 people every day for a week? Every day for a week. Everybody come. Of course, fortunately, they didn't all show up. <laughs> but many, many did. Many did. And there, it's just, it's, it's a religious discipline of generosity is what it is. They are doing this, and they're cheerful. They're cheerful. They're welcoming. It's, it's an extraordinary thing. There, another thing happened in Barcelona that uh, there was a rebellion by the women. And Diane was part of that. I know that comes as a shock to you. And also Linda Lyman, they both went. They, there was a meeting called, and they both went. And Dave and I went too. I don't know if we were supposed to be there or not, but Dave Wyman and I also went. We sat on the floor, kind of off to the side, and the women protested that it was too male-oriented. And they were right. They were absolutely right. And that uh, brought about a change in the parliament that affected 
future planning. In 2009 in Melbourne, there was a bunch of us were in Melbourne. And my favorite presenter at the Melbourne Parliament was Dr. Linda Wyman Lyman, a member of this church and professor of uh, educational administration, gave a beautiful presentation on uh, women in educational leadership. Just, just wonderful. So that's a, one, a great memory, too. We also heard a concert of sacred music out in the street in front of the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful uh, unfinished cathedral. I know some of you have seen the Sagrada Familia at some time or another. That was special. Um, in 2014, we went to Salt Lake City where the Mormons were wonderful, welcoming hosts. And they were so good and so kind. And I just want to tell you, the Mormons were not invited to the 1892 party. They were excluded. They were not invited. But in 2014, when it came to their city, they were wonderfully generous. And um, the night of the sacred music concert, the hall, it was in the Mormon tabernacle. And it completely filled. And they had no more room for seats, so they started seating people in the choir loft of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. And that's where Diane and I sat that night, in the choir loft of the Tabernacle Choir. It was wonderful. In 2019, we enjoyed the beautiful city of Toronto. And in the beautiful city of Toronto Parliament, one of the things that happened was that the global ethic which I'm going to describe for you in a minute, was amended. So that's a fascinating thing, too, because it's a living uh, document. There was, a par there was a virtual parliament in 2021, all online, and um, it wasn't as much fun. I can tell you, it wasn't as much fun. But it was a good experience, and uh, I'm glad that I could participate in that. So that brings us to this past week where a number of us were in Chicago for the parliament that was called uh, Defending Freedom and Human Rights. And there were lots of events related to human rights and freedom. The parliament is a, is a, a week that, I don't know the exact number, but there are a lot of events. I at one point heard the number there were 500 events, but I actually think there were more than 500. And that means lectures, seminars, uh, films, uh, dances, worship services, plenary sessions, um, community tours, going out to do service in, in the community. So all of that, about 500 events. I think that's a ballpark figure. And it's very difficult to do all of them. I had some wonderful experiences this past week. One of my wonderful experiences was that when I went to Langar, the, the, the Sikh lunch, I am one of those people, I can't really sit well on the floor. My body is just not, it rebels against that. And so they give you a seat, you know, they give you a chair and a table, which is part of their generosity. And I was seated next to a man named Bobby Rush. How many of you know the name Bobby? I was seated next to Bobby Rush, who was one of the founders of the Illinois Black Panther Party. Um, you know, the, the event where a bunch of them were shot and killed, including a person from Peoria, Mark, Mark Clark was one of the people who was shot in that room. He was from Peoria. Uh, Bobby said one night, he said, I was supposed to be there. And for some reason, I wasn't able to be with them, so I, that's, he said, that's why I'm here today. He's a fascinating guy, 20-year uh, congressperson, and now a member of the board of the parliament. I got to sit with him, just chance. What a wonderful thing. So I cannot help but wondering, and I, I think perhaps you will too, if these gatherings with their, you know, well-known speakers and great music and 
there was a gospel choir made me just want to die and go to heaven right on the spot. I was ready to go. I mean, with that wonder, those wonderful things going on, does that do any does it do any good in the world other than us having a good time for a while? And by the way, not everything that happens to the parliament is good. They had some problems with a sound system. They mess up. And I have learned every year that the parliament will mess up in some way. Because they're trying to run a conference for 7,000 people from 80 different countries and 100 different religious groups and people who speak different languages. But it should all work right. So that's the question that's on my mind. Does this do any good, or is it just like what I did on my summer vacation? I am of the opinion that it does do good, but I don't think I can prove it in you know, any scientific way. Maybe somebody can, but I think the parliament is kind of like going to church. You know, sometimes things happen in church. Sometimes a, a piece of music just grabs you, you know, and you feel something about that piece, or somebody says something that you remember and becomes part of your life, or you meet somebody. Sometimes people go to church, by the way, to meet a romantic partner. I know you don't know that, but, that's, but we know that. We know that's true. And you know what? I think that's great. I hope it works out. But things happen to us. Things happen to us in church or maybe at a great concert or a walk, you know, and those things happen at the parliament too. And so you might get changed by something that happens. That could happen. And I think it's pretty likely, actually. The more amazing people you put in dialogue kinds of situations and interactive situations, the more likely it is that something like that may happen, and so things like that do happen. My experience that night with Mandela really has had an effect on me ever since. So I think these kinds of get-togethers do have an effect. And they can affect, I think, somewhat the course of human affairs. Not just like you can just go, you know, there's a joke in the parliament, and the joke is only one word, kumbaya. Not that kumbaya is not a good song, but you know, there's this kind of image that if we could just all stand in a circle, you know, people from all over the world, and sing kumbaya, then it would all be fixed. Not true. Not true at all. It might be fun, but it's, it doesn't fix the world. So is there anything that could move the world even a little bit, a little nudge maybe, in some healthy direction? I believe that the global ethics statement is such a thing that has the ability to have some effect on our planet and all of us living on that planet. Planet. The, plan, the global ethics statement was released in um, 1993, and it was amended in Toronto in uh, 2021, I think is the year. What's that? 18? 2018? See? Uh, I have left a number of copies of the global ethics statement here on the table. I don't have enough to give everybody one, or I would be glad to do that, but I've left about four or five copies, and people can take a look at that. Maybe they could be in the library or something. But I'm going to tell you basically what's in that statement. And you can, please do not do it now, or, or it'd be church demerits. You can just Google global ethic, and the whole thing will just pop right up. Don't do it now. <laughs> please. But it'll pop up. And you can, there's a preamble, there's, but then there are five, um, there, there's a, what's called a fundamental demand and then five directives. And I'm going to tell you what they are. 
the fundamental um, demand is this in the global, is a proposal for a globally applicable ethical state. The first demand is, it's the only demand, every human being must be treated humanely. That's, that's the demand that they begin with. Every human being must be treated humanely. This is a little bit like our, you know, every person has worth and dignity. It's a similar, and by the way, that phrase, worth and dignity, it does not just occur in Unitarian Universalism. Other people are using that. So that's the, that's the um, fundamental demand. Every human being must be treated. All right. So there are five directives. I'm going to tell you what the five directives are. And as I said, you can Google it very easily, and you can look at the copies I left out, too. So you don't have to try to remember this. The first directive is a commitment to a culture of nonviolence and respect for life. Commitment to a culture of nonviolence and respect for life. And then there's explanatory, lots of explanatory about this. Second commitment is a commitment to a culture of solidarity and a just economic order. Culture of solidarity and a just economic order. So much of American dialogue right now is about what would be a just economic system. That's the second one. The third one is commitment to a culture of tolerance and a life of truthfulness. A culture of tolerance and a life of truthfulness. When I first read this one in 1993, I thought, truthfulness? Everybody knows you're supposed to tell the truth. I mean, what's the big deal about that? And now we have a culture with an almost total absence of commitment to truthfulness. And we see what a, what a chaotic, harmful, destructive thing that is. So that's, that's serious stuff. Commitment to a culture of tolerance and a life of truthfulness. That's the third one. The fourth one is commitment to a culture of equal rights and partnership between men and women. That's number three. Commitment to a culture of equal rights and partnership between men and women. There's a lot going on in our world around that. And the fifth one is, this is the one that was added in Toronto. Commitment to a culture of sustainability and care for the earth. I think in 1993, when Hans Kung drafted this, I don't think he saw that perhaps in the same, with the same urgency that we do now. Commitment to a culture of sustainability and care for the earth. These statements are all written in secular language. There's no appeal to anyone's religion or deity, they're all written in language that could be universally accepted, hopefully by many, many people. You can read the statement, and um, if you want to uh, take a closer look, you just Google, but not right now, Global Ethics. And it'll be before you, and it, you will also be invited, if you want to, to sign the statement. And that Obviously, it's up to you. I've signed uh, lots of people. People were signing, many, many people signed at the parliament, and they've been signing since 1993. So does this have any hope? What if a lot of people sign this? And by the way, big-time religious leaders, you know, like the Dalai Lama, and all, you know, big-time religious people signed the initial version. and Everybody can sign it if they want to. Does this have any hope? Does this have any hope? Could this bring about peace on earth? Let me just say that religions don't have a good track record of bringing about peace on earth. But I do love it on Christmas Eve, but it's not something that we do, that their religions do very well. But what I felt and observed at the parliament is 
everybody there, you know, if they're Buddhists or Jains or Sikhs or Christians or humanists, you just got, you just, from everything that went on, people know that we are at an inflection point right now. This is a moment in history. This is not something you can wait 100 years to have the next meeting about. There isn't any 100 years to wait. So we're at a moment right now where things need to be done. There are some things that need to be done, and you, you cannot take forever to do them. And they require, I come back to Mandela, they require cooperation across boundaries, boundaries of religion, boundaries of ethnicity, boundaries of race, boundaries of countries. We're at a moment that requires action across those boundaries. And there needs to be some unifying set of principles for doing that. At least I invite you to consider that possibility. It may be that the gravity of our times right now, how serious it is, may be an open door to something unifying taking place because it's so urgent. And every day, a few, maybe another million people wake up and realize that it's urgent. And so maybe that, even though that's a horrible shape that we're in, it may be an open door to some kind of unifying action on our most difficult problems, and I, I do believe that the global ethic is a proposal for building that kind of consensus. It's a proposal. Somebody is laying a proposal on the table. Saying, you know what? We think this would work. If across boundaries of religion, and race, and ethnicity, and countries, and political systems, we could unite around some basic principles that uh, could help us get through a very, very dangerous time in human history. So I think that needs to be taken seriously. I really do. And I think it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful proposal. And it's not designed to be the final word either. It's designed to be flexible. The global ethic will no doubt become part, so it already is part of a broader discussion amongst people in the world about our path forward, but it, it, it's, it's a proposal. It's a proposal. Here's something we could do. And you wouldn't have to give up your religion, and you wouldn't have to switch political parties, and you'd just be a human being. So I just want to say that this is something worthy of us looking at. It really is. It's been put together very thoughtfully. It's been considered by some really dedicated and insightful and committed people. And it's been signed by people who just care about humanity and the earth, like us, all, all over the world. Is it possible to move the trajectory that we're seemingly on and can't seem to get out of? Is it possible to move that? Yeah, I think it's possible partly because it's necessary. That's why it's possible, because it's necessary. Therefore, I, there must be a possibility of moving the trajectory that we're on. And so I bring you that message today because it's the best message I can envision to deliver at this moment. It's the best I have to offer. And I think it's, it's worthy of your thought. So I offer that to you today in a spirit of uh, community with this wonderful congregation knowing how thoughtful and how, um, how real you are.
This is part of a great creative process that is going on in the world right now. It's an experiment to see if we can work together. It's not in the bag at all. It's an experiment to see if we can work together for the good of all. May we all give our best to the experiment in, in whatever way we feel called to do. Maybe by signing this, maybe by going to another parliament, maybe by work that you're already doing in the community, maybe through political work, which is important, through all those kinds of things. May we give our best. This is a moment of truth for all of us on this planet, for our children and all Earth's creatures for generations to come. This is a moment to contribute the best that we have. All right. Well, you can remain standing if you want to, because our closing hymn, which I picked as number 143 in the gray book called Not in Vain, the Distance Beacons. You know this tune, I absolutely guarantee it. I'll, I'll buy you lunch if you don't know this tune, but I know you do. The words are by Alfred Lord Tennyson. It may be a little bit too optimistic, but you know what? Let's be optimistic for two minutes. Number 143. From the Reverend Maureen Kaloran, we extinguish this chalice flame, daring to carry forward the vision of this free faith, that freedom and reason and justice will one day prevail in this nation and across the earth. And now, dear friends, may the blessings of life be upon us as we go forth from this sacred place. May we not be overwhelmed by the challenges of our times, but rather may we be inspired to give our best to our communities, to seize this moment of deep need 
and re-energize the best of human wisdom. In Rumi's words, ours is no caravan of despair. Come and join in the caravan of hope. Onward towards the very best that we can create. So may it be for us.